The next morning, Harry, Ron, Hermione, and the Weasleys take another portkey back to the burrow. There is a rather touching moment when they get back, where a sobbing Mrs. Weasley, who read in the paper what had happened, embraces the twins because she had angrily told them off about their jokes before they left, and she was worried that would be the last thing she said to them. When Mr. Weasley reads the Daily Prophet article about the attack on the campground, he finds it was written by Rita Skeeter and emphasizes the ministry's failings and intentionally inserts things to spread rumors that things were far worse than they really were. And I suppose I might as well take this moment to talk about Rita Skeeter, the nosiest of reporters, and that's saying something. The movie really cut down on her role in the story. In the book, she's a more constant presence throughout, writing defamatory articles about several people and just generally being a nuisance. However, there is also a bit of a mystery surrounding her, as she seems to know things she couldn't possibly know that she writes about in her articles. Hermione, who takes a serious dislike towards her, becomes determined to find out how she's getting all of this information, hoping it's something illegal she can use against her. As Hermione discovers in the end, Rita Skeeter is actually an unregistered animagus who can transform into a beetle. Hermione catches her in a jar and blackmails her into not writing any more defamatory articles by threatening to tell the Ministry her secret. This whole mystery and plotline was cut from the movie, and overall, I think it was the right decision, as it's not really necessary to the plot. However, I also kind of feel like if they weren't going to include that plotline, why not just cut her from the film altogether? Don't get me wrong, Miranda Richardson did a great job. I wanted to chuck this Rita out a window even more than the book one. I just feel like if they weren't going to pay off her storyline, they might as well have just completely cut her from the film to spend time on more important things. The rest of the stay at the borough is focused mostly on Mr. Weasley and Percy telling the family about how the Ministry is dealing with the heat they're getting after the screw-up at the World Cup, and the disappearance of Bertha Jorkins, which Rita Skeeter also caught wind of and reported. This is also where, in the book, Ron receives his dress robes from his mom, which was moved to a later scene at Hogwarts in the film, and... Yeah, those robes are pretty awful. On the morning of the students' departure for Hogwarts, they find that Amos Diggory is using the Weasleys' fireplace to talk to Mr. Weasley, much like Sirius does later, though it's not described in the book like the logs shifting to form a face, it just looks like the person's head sitting in the fireplace. Amos tells Mr. Weasley that there was a disturbance at Mad-Eye Moody's place. Apparently, Moody heard an intruder in his yard, and his enchanted dustbins went haywire, catching the attention of nearby muggles. Amos, as well as most of the people at the Ministry, suggest that this was just Moody being his usual paranoid self, and they need Mr. Weasley to go see him to smooth things over before he and the Ministry at large get into even more trouble. Of course, as we learn at the end of the book, it was not just Moody being paranoid. He was attacked by Barty Crouch Jr. and Peter Pettigrew. This was where the two of them captured Moody, and Crouch Jr. took his place. Because at this point, Crouch Jr. is no longer under his father's control. You see, at one point, Bertha Jorkins, while visiting Crouch, accidentally discovered Crouch Jr., who was supposed to be dead. Crouch put an extremely powerful memory charm on her to make her forget. After Pettigrew captured her and brought her to Voldemort, Voldemort broke the memory charm and learned from her that Crouch Jr., one of his most faithful servants, was still alive. She had also told him that Mad-Eye Moody would be teaching at Hogwarts this year as extra security for the Triwizard Tournament that was to take place. So after the Quidditch World Cup, when the Ministry's security was more relaxed, Voldemort and Wormtail visited Crouch, put him under the Imperious Curse, and lifted it from Junior, who they sent to impersonate Moody at Hogwarts. Again, this is all stuff we learn at the end of the book from Barty Crouch Jr. after he's been revealed. So, Mrs. Weasley takes the students to King's Cross Station by ordering muggle taxis, and she, Bill, and Charlie keep hinting annoyingly about the special event taking place at Hogwarts as they board the train. The train ride is different in both versions. In the movie, this is where we and Harry meet Cho Chang for the first time, and much like in the previous book, Harry has a crush on her right away. I think this was a good way of getting around not having introduced her earlier. This is also where Harry writes to Sirius in the movie, which of course he did back at the Dursleys in the book. In the book, a few little things happen, but mostly very cuttable. Seamus, Dean, and Neville arrive in the compartment, and all of them tell Neville about the Quidditch World Cup, since he wasn't allowed to go. Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle show up as well. 
Malfoy sees Ron's dress robes and makes fun of them, and asks Ron and Harry if they're going to enter, without saying what he's talking about and making fun of them for not knowing. We also learn a bit more about the wizard school Durmstrang here, since Malfoy was talking about how his father initially wanted to send him there instead of Hogwarts. His mother didn't want him sent so far away. Apparently Durmstrang doesn't even let Muggleborn students in and actually teaches the Dark Arts to students, rather than just defense against them. Makes sense, considering their headmaster is a former Death Eater. Also, the fact that Gellert Grindelwald was a Durmstrang student probably doesn't help its reputation. <laughs> Speaking of Durmstrang, in the movie, they and Beaubaton arrive immediately and introduce themselves at the opening feast. In the book, they don't arrive until a bit later. There are other differences about their arrival as well, but I'll get to that when they actually arrive. After an encounter with Peeves the Poltergeist, who is throwing water balloons at arriving students, they all enter the Great Hall. In the book, we actually see the sorting ceremony for the first years, the first one Harry has actually been to since book one, and one of the new Gryffindors is Dennis Creevy, Colin's younger brother. But there was no real need for the movie to show this, so they didn't. The students also learn from Nearly Headless Nick the school food is prepared by house elves who work in the kitchens. After hearing this, Hermione angrily refuses to eat it since it was made through what she sees as slave labor. Speaking of Nick, notice something missing from the movies starting with this one? Where are all the ghosts? In the first three movies, we saw ghosts floating around Hogwarts all the time. Sometimes they had funny interactions with the students, and sometimes they were just randomly there in the background. I really liked that attention to detail. It made the world feel more... Uh, alive. Starting with this movie, however, the only times we see ghosts are when they have a part to play in the story, like Moaning Myrtle in this movie and the Grey Lady in Deathly Hallows Part 2. Aside from that, they just seem to have vanished. During this scene, we see in both versions the arrival of one of my favorite characters, Mad-Eye Moody. Though in the book, this is before Dumbledore announces the Triwizard Tournament. And yes, I know this is actually Barty Crouch Jr. in disguise, but I'm still going to refer to him as Moody. I absolutely love Brendan Gleeson in this part. I can't imagine any other actor playing the character. Well, almost any other actor. I will say, the movie toned down Moody's battle damage a good bit. He's supposed to be even more scarred, and a large chunk of his nose is supposed to be missing. I don't blame the filmmakers for not wanting to CG that in, though. The movies also give him a metal leg rather than a wooden leg, which he has in the book, which I'm also fine with. I actually kind of like it. So finally, Dumbledore announces that the Triwizard Tournament will be taking place this year, and as a result, there will be no Quidditch Tournament between the houses. He goes into more detail about the history of the tournament than in the movie, explaining how it was a way of fostering relationships between the schools of Hogwarts, Beaubaton, and Durmstrang, but it was eventually discontinued due to the death toll getting too high. Now, with extra safety precautions being added, they've decided to give it another shot. The prize for winning the tournament will be a thousand galleons in prize money, the Triwizard Cup, and eternal glory for the winner's school. In the movie, he only announces the latter two, not the prize money. Of course, he then announces the new rule that only students who are 17 or older can enter the tournament, which pisses off many people, especially the Weasley twins. In the movie, it's Barty Crouch who announces this rule, but in the book, he hasn't even arrived yet. The twins, of course, are determined to find a way to get into the tournament. Dumbledore also doesn't reveal the Goblet of Fire yet in the book, since they need to wait for the other schools to arrive before entering names. Something we don't see in the movie, due to the lack of inner dialogue, is that while Harry never seriously considers entering the tournament, he does fantasize about winning it, and the crowd cheering around him, showing a bit more of his, as the Sorting Hat put it, thirst to prove yourself. One other thing I'll mention here is that this movie seems to have decided to turn Filch into a comic relief character. While this is fun, it is very jarring after his portrayal in the previous films and really emphasizes the difference in directors. Now, after this, the movie does something kind of weird, where it shows Karkaroff suspiciously entering the Great Hall at night and closing the doors behind him. In fact, it does a lot of things like this with him, like focusing on him making some sort of menacing expression or laughing at Harry being attacked by the dragon, it just seems like the movie is trying way too hard to make you think he's the bad guy. 
so much that it becomes almost too obvious that he's a red herring. Granted, he is the prime suspect in the book as well, but there are also things to suggest he might not be, and there are other suspects in addition to him, whereas in the movie, he seems to be the only one that's focused on at all. Also, what was he doing sneaking in there like that if he wasn't entering Harry into the tournament? That's never answered. It's almost like the only purpose of that scene was to make us think it was him. But moving on, in the movie we cut right to Moody's defense against the dark arts class, however there's some more stuff before that in the book. I've mentioned before about how the movies really cut down on classes. Well, there are three classes they cut here. A herbology class, where they have to collect pus from some slug-like plants called bubba tubers. A care of magical creatures class, where Hagrid has them take care of extremely dangerous lobster-like creatures called blast-ended scroots, which even he doesn't know how to take care of and a divination class where Professor Trelawney has them divine the future based on the movements of the stars and planets. The herbology class doesn't play any part later, so that was completely cuttable. The blast-ended screws are an ongoing plotline throughout the book, especially relating to Hagrid's troubles, which we learn more about in this book. Ultimately, I see why they had to be cut for time, though. The divination classes in this book as a whole are pretty unnecessary, but with that said, I do find them really funny because of how ridiculous Trelawney is, and Harry and Ron's reactions to her, and the class in general. Like, this moment here is just pure gold. Which planet's that, Professor? It is Uranus, my dear. Can I have a look at Uranus too, Lavender? We also see a bit later Harry and Ron doing their homework for her, and just completely making it all up. Next Monday, I am likely to develop a cough owing to the unlikely conjunction of Mars and Jupiter. You know her. Just put down loads of misery. She'll lap it up. Right. Okay. On Monday, I will be in danger of, uh, burns. On Tuesday, I'll lose a treasured possession. Good one. Why don't you get stabbed in the back by someone you thought was a friend? Yeah, cool. And on Wednesday, I'll come off worse in a fight. Ah, I was gonna have a fight. Okay, I'll lose a bet instead. Yeah, you'll be betting I'll win my fight. I don't know, I just love quiet, fun moments like this. That said, yeah, it's not necessary to the story, so I can't complain about them cutting it. Following these classes, the trio has a run-in with Malfoy, who gleefully reads them an article by Rita Skeeter, talking about how Arthur Weasley, who she calls Arnold, embarrassed the Ministry by going to the aid of Mad-Eye Moody after what proved to be yet another false alarm. Malfoy proceeds to insult Mrs. Weasley, and Harry retaliates by insulting Malfoy's mother. This pisses Malfoy off, who pulls out his wand and attacks Harry. And this is where we get the bouncing ferret scene in the book, where Moody turns Malfoy into a ferret and bounces him about. Something the movie pushed to a later moment. So yeah, in the book this is our first real introduction to Moody. Quite the first impression, huh? <laughs> He doesn't stick his tongue out at McGonagall like in the movie, though. I feel like that was more Barty Crouch Jr. breaking character for a moment. Moody's not that immature. In the book, we also see during this scene that Moody's magical eye can see through the back of his head. The Defense Against the Dark Arts class plays out pretty similarly to how it does in the movie, with Moody teaching the students about the three unforgivable curses. Imperius, a.k.a. Brainwashing, Cruciatus, a.k.a. Torture, and Avada Kedavra, a.k.a. Instant Death. The movie does a good job getting across Moody's intense and paranoid nature. I'm here because Dumbledore asked me. End of story. Goodbye. The end. When it comes to the dark arts, I believe in a practical approach. Now, the minister says you're too young to see what these curses do. I say different. You need to know what you're up against. You need to be prepared. How do we sort out the liars? We see in both versions that the use of the Cruciatus Curse seems to make Neville particularly uncomfortable. This, as we learn later, is because it was what was used to torture his parents into vegetables, essentially. And seeing as Barty Crouch Jr. was one of the ones who did that to Neville's parents, I have to say, making him watch it up close is incredibly sadistic. We also, of course, learn that the Killing Curse is what we used on Harry's parents and himself. One thing I think they could have made more clear in the movie is that not just anyone can cast the killing curse, or really any of the unforgivable curses. You need to really want to kill or hurt people. Avada Kedavra is a curse that needs a powerful bit of magic behind it. You could all get out your wands right now and point them at me and say the words, and I doubt I'd get so much as a nosebleed. 
Also, one thing I want to mention here, it's a small thing, but I think it's a pretty clever way of misleading us. At this point in the series, we've kind of come to take it for granted that Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers are only going to last one year. And as such, there's a certain level of suspicion that comes with them. Maybe the reason they don't come back is because they're the bad guy. Now, of course, Moody, as a longtime Auror responsible for the capture of countless Dark Wizards, should naturally be above suspicion. But still, there's probably going to be a bit of doubt regardless, as we wonder why he's only going to last a year. However, Rowling very cleverly puts an end to our questions about that right away. Moody tells the class that he's only there for a year as a favor to Dumbledore, extra security for the Triwizard Tournament, and then back to retirement. So because of that, we aren't wondering the reason why he won't be back after this, as it's already been answered. Again, I know it's a small thing, but I think it's a clever bit of misdirection. So after the class, Moody brings Neville into his office for a cup of tea, and he gives him the book on water plants. Of course, the reason he did this was because it contained information on Gillyweed, and he hoped Neville would use that knowledge to help Harry in the second task of the tournament. In the movie, this works. In the book, not so much, but I'll get there when I get there. At this point in the book, Hermione starts a new movement called SPEW, or the Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare, with the aim of making house elves more equal with wages, holidays, jobs in the ministry, etc., whether they want it or not, and instantly assigns Harry and Ron the roles of secretary and treasurer respectively, despite their lack of enthusiasm for the whole thing. This is a bit of a crusade Hermione will be on for the rest of the books. Here's all I'm going to say about it. The filmmakers completely cut this out of the movies. They were right to do so. Harry finally receives a response from Sirius saying he's headed back north after hearing about Harry's scar along with all the other rumors. This actually upsets Harry, who thinks he's responsible for pulling Sirius out of hiding, so he sends a response trying to smooth things over and saying that he was just imagining his scar hurting. We then see another Defense Against the Dark Arts class, where Moody places the Imperious Curse on each student to see how well they resist it. None of them are able to, except Harry, who actually manages to throw it off. We're told that the teachers are all increasing the students' workload to prepare them for their OWLs next year. OWL stands for Ordinary Wizarding Level. There are these huge exams the students take in their fifth year on everything they've learned so far. Harry gets his reply from Sirius, who tells him he's back in the country and to use a different owl every time he sends him a letter from now on. So now we get to the moment in the book where the other two schools arrive, and it's much less, shall we say, flashy and show-offy than it is in the movie. The students don't put on some big show when they arrive, and they're greeted on the grounds outside the castle rather than in the Great Hall. Also, I don't know why the movie decided to make Beaubaton an all-girls school and Durmstrang an all-boys school. That's not the case in the book for either of them. Beaubaton arrive in their huge flying horse carriage, and Durmstrang arrive in their really cool ship. Something we notice about the students from each school pretty quickly in the book is that the students from Durmstrang seem much more impressed by Hogwarts than the ones from Beaubaton, who seem much more snobbish about it, comparing it unfavorably to their own castle. And of course, we meet the two headmasters, Madame Maxime for Beaubaton and Igor Karkaroff for Durmstrang. Karkaroff is described in the book as having a fruity, unctuous voice and a smile that doesn't quite reach his cold eyes implying a friendly, jovial personality that is more of a put-on than not. In the movie, there doesn't even seem to be much of a put-on. He just comes across as generally cold and unsociable, except when he hugs Dumbledore at the start. A moment I actually did like. I also like this brief moment showing him dancing at the Yule Ball, hinting at a bit more depth to his character that the book never gave him. As for Madame Maxime, the movie pretty much got her right, at least in terms of the stuff they showed. They did cut out one part with her that would have made her character a bit more dynamic, though. I'll talk about that when I get there, though. As the Durmstrang students leave their ship, we see Victor Crumb again for the first time since the Quidditch match. Crumb is very... simplified in the movie. The movie portrays him as sort of a brainless jock who excels at physical activities but doesn't have much going on mentally. In the book, he at first comes across as just being kind of grumpy and standoffish, but we do see him open up to certain people. 
When he starts dating Hermione, we see him talking very animatedly to her, and when he thinks there are romantic feelings between her and Harry, he actually takes Harry aside to make sure he's not overstepping any bounds. And when Harry reassures him that there's nothing between them, he becomes quite friendly towards Harry as well. Unfortunately, this kind of oversimplification happened to a lot of characters in this movie. One of those characters we meet shortly after this in the Great Hall, Fleur Delacour. Ron, as well as most of the boys, are immediately smitten by her, and Ron insists that because of her beauty, she must be a Vila. As we learn a bit later, she is in fact a quarter Vila, as her grandmother was one. Now, in the movie, Fleur comes across as very sweet and friendly right off the bat. However, that is not the case in the book. In the book, she's actually very full of herself and has this I'm too good for you sort of attitude. She also acts very condescending towards Harry after he's entered into the tournament, calling him a little boy. It's only after Harry saves her sister from the lake that her attitude towards him changes and we start to see her in a new light. But moving on, Ludo Bagman and Barty Crouch both arrive during this feast since they organize the tournament and will be acting as judges. Dumbledore then brings in the Goblet of Fire and explains to everyone how to enter the tournament. As you can probably tell, the movie combined this feast and the start of term into one scene, which honestly does make sense. As the students leave the Great Hall, in the book we see a rather intense moment between Karkaroff and Moody. As a shocked Karkaroff recognizes Harry, Moody arrives and confirms it is indeed Harry Potter. Karkaroff is both enraged and scared to see Moody, and Moody clearly doesn't like Karkaroff. As we learn later, this is because Karkaroff used to be a Death Eater, and Moody was the one who caught him and sent him to Azkaban. Of course, the real reason for Moody's dislike is because Barty Crouch Jr. hates Karkaroff for selling out his master for his freedom. We also see here, before he meets Moody, Karkaroff's favoritism towards Crumb. He gives Crumb everything and always makes sure he's doing okay, but he treats the rest of his students rather coldly. Back to the sheep then. Victor, how are you feeling? Did you eat enough? Should I send for some vine from the kitchens? Professor, I would like some vine, said one of the other Durmstrang boys, hopefully. I wasn't offering it to you, Polyakov, snapped Karakarov, his warmly paternal air vanishing in an instant. I notice you have dribbled food all down the front of your robes again, disgusting boy. So, we see students enter their names into the goblet. The movie, understandably, only focuses on the ones who end up being chosen. In the book, we also see that Angelina Johnson from the Gryffindor Quidditch team and Warrington from the Slytherin Quidditch team both entered as well. And, of course, Fred and George try to cheat the age line by drinking aging potion and end up growing white hair and beards. They don't get into a fight like in the movie, though. They just point and laugh at each other. In the book before the Halloween feast where the champions are chosen, the trio visit Hagrid, who they find is dressed fancy and has styled his hair. The reason for this being, as we see when they leave, because Hagrid has a thing for Madame Maxime, who he chats with on the way back up to the castle, completely forgetting about Harry, Ron, and Hermione. We don't learn about this relationship until a bit later in the movie. So, we see the champions being selected, and Harry is mysteriously entered as a fourth. Now, the mystery of who put Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire is, of course, the biggest question throughout the book, and something the characters are constantly trying to figure out. This is the one mystery the film didn't cut, but the question does seem to get significantly less focused than in the book. I've actually spoken to a couple people who admitted after watching that it never even really occurred to them to care who did it until it was revealed at the end. Oh, by the way, I don't know why, but I really like this sort of encouraging shoulder slap Dumbledore gives Cedric here. So Harry is sent to the back with the other champions, and here we see a scene that makes the same mistake that I think a good number of scenes in this film do. Using the same dialogue from the book to get across the same information in a much shorter time. These scenes tend to feel a bit rushed to me and don't give us enough time to absorb what's being said, and the context for what's being said seems to change as well. Ironically, I feel like these scenes would work better if they actually diverge from the book a bit more and change the dialogue in a way that feels more natural, but still gets across the same information. Some things from the book that are lost in adaptation here include Ludo Bagman excitedly announcing to the other champions that there's a fourth champion. Obviously, he spotted a way of winning back the money he lost gambling by gambling on Harry. <laughs> 
Karkaroff, in contrast, is furious with Dumbledore, believing that he's trying to cheat in the tournament by sneaking Harry's name in, thereby gaining a second champion for his school. Madame Maxime is pissed too, but she doesn't necessarily blame Dumbledore. She just thinks Harry found a way to trick his way into the tournament. Snape, of course, is convinced that Potter is trying to break the rules for personal glory again, another case of the movie softening him, as he appears to believe Harry there. Barty Crouch is also described as looking rather ill here. As we learn at the end, ever since the Quidditch World Cup, Crouch has actually been under the Imperious Curse. When Wormtail and Voldemort rescued his son from him, Voldemort put him under the curse and ordered him to go about his business as usual. Killing him would have raised too many questions. We also get a bit more info from Moody, Crouch, and Bagman in the book about how the Goblet of Fire's binding magical contract makes the champions unable to not compete once their names come out. And when Karkaroff insists they set the Goblet up again so that all three schools can have two champions, it's explained that the Goblet has gone out and won't reignite again until the next tournament. Moody also theorizes that someone put Harry's name in hoping he would be killed, and that they used a Confundus charm to trick the Goblet and enter Harry's name in under a fourth school. Now, before we move on, let's talk about that infamous moment. Harry, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Dumbledore asked calmly. Everyone's already made fun of this, so I won't say too much. I will just say that Dumbledore throughout this movie really doesn't feel like Dumbledore to me. He seems way too intense, angry, and over-emotional. Harry Potter! Severus Snape was indeed a Death Eater, and prior to Lord Voldemort's downfall, turned spy for us at great personal it's risk. Alive! Today he's no more a Death Severus Eater than Snape I am. Every time I get close to an answer, it slips away. It's maddening. Again, I don't blame Gambon for this. I blame the direction he was given by Mike Newell. There's a scene the movie added after this where Dumbledore, McGonagall, and Snape are discussing what just happened and how to respond to it. I actually like this scene because it really shows McGonagall's concern for Harry, and I find it really interesting to see Snape interacting only with other teachers with no students around. That's not something we see very often, and he tends to come across a bit different in those situations. It would have been especially interesting if they had kept from the previous scene Snape's disbelief that Harry didn't enter himself. To follow that up with this scene where he's analyzing the situation with the other teachers would kind of hint that some of his behavior around the students may be a bit of a put-on. It could also function as misdirection to make us distrust him given that he's advocating for the path of not doing anything about it, which of course would ultimately lead to Voldemort's return. I also like how this scene foreshadows the Pensy by showing Dumbledore dropping one of his memories into it. Now, while I do like all of that, I do have an issue with this scene from a conceptual standpoint. They shouldn't be discussing whether or not to allow Harry to compete because they can't stop it. Like Crouch said, it's a binding magical contract. The movie doesn't make it clear what this means and makes it sound like Dumbledore just doesn't want to break the rules. And frankly, makes him and Snape kind of seem like fools. Huh, <laughs> that rhymed. So, going back to Gryffindor Tower. In the book, Harry is enthusiastically greeted by the other Gryffindors who throw a huge party despite him clearly not being in the mood. Once he finally gets away from them, he goes up to the dormitory and finds Ron, who of course doesn't believe him. This is another place where I feel like the movies did Ron a disservice. Yeah, he doesn't believe Harry in the book either, and their friendship is temporarily broken, but he comes across as much meaner and whinier about it in the movie. In the book, while he's clearly unhappy that Harry didn't include him, he doesn't lash out at Harry right away. He simply asks him how he got his name in. Harry is surprised that Ron doesn't believe him and tries to tell him he's wrong, getting more and more annoyed by Ron's stubbornness as he does so until eventually he, understandably, lashes out. And it's only then that Ron really gets sulky about it. So at least there was some escalation. In the movie, Ron's just bitchy about it right off the bat. How did you do it? Never mind. Doesn't matter. Might have let your best friend know, though. You're being stupid. Yeah, that's me. Ron Weasley, Harry Potter's stupid friend. It also doesn't help that the movies never really showed much of Ron's insecurity. He's grown up in a poor family and has always lived in the shadow of his older, more accomplished brothers. 
On top of that, his two best friends are a world-famous person and the best student in their year. So even with them, he's kind of seen by outsiders as the other guy. He's constantly been fighting these feelings of inadequacy, and Harry getting to be in the tournament when he can't be was simply the straw that broke the camel's back. To be clear, I do still think Ron is in the wrong here. He should have believed Harry. But it's much more understandable in the book why he doesn't. In fact, it's not even really that he doesn't. I think he knows deep down that Harry's telling the truth. He's just let his jealousy get to him. Another thing that gets lost in adaptation, again due to the lack of inner dialogue, is Harry's feelings about all this. Not so much being entered into the tournament, I think the movie actually does a good job showing his fear, denial, and dislike of the attention it brings him. In fact, this is one of the few times where I think the movies really do get across how much Harry hates his own fame. No, it's more Harry's feelings surrounding Ron not believing him and hanging out with Hermione instead that get lost in the movie. In fact, we actually learn some interesting things about Harry here and how he feels about his two best friends. Because he and Ron aren't talking to each other, Harry spends a lot of time alone with Hermione instead. And we learn from his internal narration that of his two best friends, he actually prefers Ron because he has a lot more fun with him. And as much as he likes her, he just can't relate to Hermione in the same way. And I think Hermione knows that. In the movies, partly because we're not aware of his thoughts, it often seems more like Hermione is his best friend. I mean, look at this moment in Half-Blood Prince where the two of them are talking and Ron is just sitting in the back. But we're not talking about Half-Blood Prince yet. I think the awkwardness and lack of meaningful social interaction between Harry and Hermione during this time also highlights just how important Ron is to the group. He may not be the smartest or the most skilled, but the three of them only feel like a true team when Ron is with them. He's the heart of the trio, the glue that holds them together. We start to see this here, and it's solidified later in Deathly Hallows when Ron leaves the group, and without him, Harry and Hermione just kind of fall apart and aren't able to get much of anything accomplished. 